I can hear you. You have the floor, my friend. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Yes. Thank you. Again, assalamu alaikum, Ramadan Mubarak. Uh, I'm fellow learners and guests. Uh, I was introduced to lunatics through my daughter, uh, and I met uh, Imam Instructor Bilal in uh, June of uh, 2016, and immediately it was an instruction, uh, beginning with form and function, and uh, it was enlightening because it, it opened my eyes uh, to some things that I just took for granted. And uh, it also uh, showed me that everything has form and function, but the main thing was is the, the fitra and the, as form and function and the logic. But also it showed me that genetics was introducing us to a platform so that we could understand the Quran better. And the purpose of the Quran was to fix all that, which becomes dysfunctional in human nature. So, Nunetics has been an eye-opener and a learning for me. So for four years now, for nearly four years, I have, uh, I don't think I've missed, but maybe two classes in that time. But Instructor Bilal has, uh, he has done a lot of work in bringing Nunetics to, to the public. Uh, the book Nunetics, Quranic Connections, The Nature of Life, The Etymology of Marriage, The N-Word. These are all texts that he has published and he's continued to publish. So he has uh, presented a body of knowledge for us to work in and grow in. And uh, I like the, the uh, ayah, I can't quote it exactly, but Allah has created, a, created us like plants growing in the earth. And that, that has a deep meaning and a metaphorical meaning in that uh, the human creature can grow or is, is designed to grow uh, into, into a cosmic consciousness. So with that, there is so much that I could say other than that. But in reference to words and their meaning, you know, their their words, the words that have me have meaning, but also they have frequencies. So the frequencies are even seen in music, uh, in uh, the notes of music A B C D E. And, and F and G, these these frequencies are the same, and, if you, you, and, and as used in music from Mozart, he used the same frequencies that Bob Marley used or Ray Charles. Nunetics as seed letters enable us to form thousands of words millions of words, but we're all using words. So I've learned, this is what I've learned and just taking it, not taking it for granted, but not seeing the logic behind it. The logic that Imam W.D. Muhammad left for us, uh, Imam, w, uh, Imam Bilal has expanded on that and has uh, introduced particularly to me and to us a higher understanding of what uh, the inheritance that we were left with through Imam W.D. Muhammad. So with that, uh, Instructor Bilal and learners, I'm going to conclude. I'm a little nervous. I don't ever get chances. I don't speak very often to people, even though there's no one present here but me. But it's a little nervous, a little nervous here. But thank you for this opportunity, Instructor Bilal. And uh, I hope that uh, I, I was clear in sharing what I shared. Thank yes, you so yes sir. Thank you. Nervousness notwithstanding, you did an excellent job. Thank you for that opening. And uh, let's begin at the beginning with our Amir Adib Abdullah opening us up with the opening chapter of the Quran, Al Fatiha. Are you there, sir? I'm here, sir. Go right ahead. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Al-Rahmani, Al-Rahimi, Maliki, Yawlukin, 
إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين We are grateful We are eternally grateful for the, the teaching and the wisdom of Iman Ward B. Muhammad When he talked about the Al-Fatiha he was raising us in, in, in all the the Ummah in what things like the person before was that we took for granted. When he said the the rubber, the make the maintainer and sustain of all the systems of knowledge, that was a whole new chapter in in the way of deciphering and, and bringing uh, the full meaning, extricating the full meaning out of El Fatiha. He talked about each and every every verse being similar to the shock. But I'm not going to go into that, but I'm saying there's more to learn or there's more to meet the eye. And the main reason for this that we have asked our Creator to help us from going while at door and bring us back to our original human nature. And that these first verses are the opening that we can enter into a new understanding with me next. Shukran. Afwan, thank you very much. Let me just get a confirmation that you can hear me loud and clear. <clears throat> yes, I can. Loud and clear. All right. So thank you to today's audience. I am your international instructor, Benjamin Bilal, joining you on this Tuesday, May 19th, 2020. Just happens to be the anniversary of the birth date of one of our modern day African American heroes, that is Malcolm Shabazz. We ask that Allah forgive him of any sins and uh, grant him the rewards that his good works have earned him and then multiply those rewards. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim with Allah's signature frequency the merciful benefactor is one of those frequencies that op Allah operates upon and the merciful redeemer is the secondary frequency that Allah operates upon both of those frequencies are operating continuously throughout creation to deliver particularly the human life, to the level of achievement, the level of excellence <clears throat> that Allah intended for the human being to achieve. It is said that the first revelation revealed to Muhammad is now found in the 96th surah or chapter of the Quran and it uh, reads as such. Ikra bismi rabbika ledi khalaq khalaq al insana min alaq. Translated into English, read with the name of your Lord who created, created the human being from an attaching substance. My extenuated explanation of that ayah reads thus read with the frequency signature of your evolver who created created the social slash thinking person from an attaching substance this first call to reading is a reading which has absolutely nothing to do with two-dimensional reading that we perform from eyes to page. There were no pages. The ancient Arabs operated upon two major industries and Allah in revealing the Quran to Muhammad who was ethnically and geographically a part of this people called Arab, he revealed the Quran 
in a language construct that would be best understood and absorbed by the Arab brain of that time. Those two major industries were agriculture and trade. The word Ikra, which we have been translating as read, is actually an agricultural term. The prefix agri in agriculture is from the word ikra. Ikra gave us agri. From ikra we also get the English words accrue, which means to collect. Ikra, agri, accrue, A-C-C-R-U-E. From Ikra, we also get the English word acre, A-C-R-E, which means cultivatable land. Acre. Ikra gives us the prefix agri, gives us the English word accru, and also gives us the English word acre. The verb from which Ikra derives or is derived is pronounced Qara'a. And Qara'a gives us the English words carry, C-A-R-R-Y, and core, C-O-R-E. Bearing in mind that although these words begin with C in the English language, they are pronounced as a K sound. And in English, the letter C is going to be pronounced either with a K sound or with an S sound. There is no true sound for the English letter C. So as in the word circus, which contains two C's, the first one is pronounced as an S sound, sir, while the second syllable is pronounced as a K sound, cuss, sir, cuss. So kara'a, I repeat, gives us the words carry and core. And it does so in that we collect we then carry the produce back to a core place, such as the barn or the kitchen table. In addition to these words, we also get the word call. L interchanges with R in linguistics. So CL or the KL sound is also the KR sound. So the QR sound, which is also the KR sound, the guttural liquid sound is what we're talking about, linguistically speaking. That ra gives us ka la, as in call. So ikra is also a call. And that's why you'll hear some grammarians translate the word ikra as not only read, but recite. When you recite, you're calling the attention of the people towards what it is you are reciting. Call also means to invite, and therefore ikra is also an invitation. Making the connection with agriculture, the farmer invites others to purchase or eat from the cultivation once the harvest is collected. Harvest, with its H-R-V consonants, is from the Arabic word harb, which has the H-R-B connections. And harb or harbun in Arabic means warfare, where blood is spilled. The blood that is spilled during the harvest is the greenish yellow plant blood called the chlorophyll when the life of the plant is ended during the harvesting process the pulling it up out of the ground to pulling it out of the tree process you're disconnecting that life form with its sustenance greenish yellow is the coloring which exists just beneath the heart chakra, which is colored green, and the solar plexus chakra, which is colored yellow. 
So if you're developing internally and you're at the solar plexus level, you're at the level of your personal ego. And your personal ego is given the color yellow. Your ego says, look at me. In the same way that the sun which has risen in the sky says, pay attention to me. I'm trying to show you something. The sun in you, which is your ego, has completed its job and it's now handing the mantle upwards towards the productive nature in your heart's need to be charitable and to be free. Imam Muhammad taught a lesson once under the title of Freedom is Green. That was the name of his lecture. Freedom is Green. And he was explaining how when the plant life comes up out of the ground, it comes up pale until it hits the light of the sun. The sun's rays is what turns it and it turns it uh, green by delivering chlorophyll, what we now call the plant's blood, the plant's sustenance. So it's that green in the plant that represents the plant's freedom from being underground to being something that can be witnessed now in the public and can be shared with the public. That's freedom. Green is an anagram for energy if you take the Y off. And your heart's concerns are where the ideal energy is for human growth and development. If you want to grow as a true human in this world or in this earth, your heart is going to have to become concerned about human growth and development because that, I repeat, is where the ideal energy is. Once again, energy, the word energy, E-N-E-R-G-Y, is an anagram for green or greeny, G-R-E-E-N-Y, same exact letters. The shedding of the blood by the Khalifa that's spoken of in the Quran as being a, concer a concern of the angels. Are you going to create one who's going to make mischief and shed the blood? Is what the angels asked Allah. So the shedding of the blood by the Khalifa is actually the sharing of the love, the charity, the forgiveness, and the compassion in the forms of Energies that are emanating from the heart and the sharing of those concerns with all of humanity. This is why Allah answered the angels by saying, I have knowledge, I have science that you don't have. I know what you do not know in terms of ilm. This is why the only other mentioning of Khalifa in the form of a person in the Quran is in reference to the prophet Daoud. Daoud who in uh, English is called David, in Hebrew is called David. Daoud is the only prophet whose name signifies balance in its spelling. In Arabic, we use the letters Del, Wow, Dal. You see how balanced that is? Dal is on both sides, Wa in the middle. Almost like an Oreo cookie. <laughs> And his name means balanced love. From its root, we also get the actual word for love. Wadud. Now there are 14 words in the Arabic lexicon for love. 14 different levels or stages of love. But Wadud happens to be one of the strongest words that you can use for love. It's a word that Allah uses in the Quran to describe the kind of concern that couples should have for each other, which binds them together. Wadud. This is actually where the English word wood comes from. It comes from Wadud. The English word W-O-O-D comes from the Arabic word Wadud, W-A-D-O-O-D. 
And wood comes from that word because wood is one of the most durable materials that earth has ever produced. And this is why we use it to build our homes and to build other structures that we intend to uh, be long lasting. Just like in a marriage, wadud is the love necessary for a long lasting relationship. Isn't that beautiful? When we call out in the Adhan for people to come to Salah and to come to Falah, they translate Falah as coming to success. Falah, however, is the success that the farmer experiences, which allows him or her to harvest their crops. C-R-O-P-S. The word falah, with its consonantal connections of fa, lam, ha, or f, l, h, is consonantally connected to the word crop with its ka, ra, pa sound. K, r, p is interchangeable with the f, l, h in that h is interchangeable with the K sound as a guttural. The R in crop is interchangeable with the L as a liquid letter. The L in falah. And the P in the English word crop is a labial which is interchangeable with the F in falah which is also a labial. So falah, if you interpose the letters, just put them in different positionings in the word. Consonantally speaking, they're going to be absolutely related to each other, which means that they're going to share themes. They will be related to each other thematically. Add to that group of themes the word Khalifa, because it is also consonantally connected to the word Falah, to the word crop in English, and also to the word crap. <laughs> now, do you see why those angels were so worried about this guy being created? Said, oh God, are you going to create a man from crap who's going to uh, cause a mischief and shed the blood? Blood in the stool is no joke. <laughs> That's a sign of sickness, <laughs> internal problems. Huh? We're talking conceptually now and deeply on the philosophical level. So we're talking now, let's add them up, about the words falah, which means success. The word crop, which means a successful farmer's returns, his crop. The word crap, which refers mostly to dung or things that are wasteful, wasted, that you don't need anymore and you get rid of it. Hmm? You get rid of it out of your system. Out of your house. I don't get this crap out of my house. Right. And also the word Khalifa. That the angels quote unquote had questions about. Crap. When you think about it. As it comes from the human body. Is dark stinky mud. Fashioned into shape. What the Quran refers to as Hama'in Masnoon. Dark, fetid, or stinky, or smelly mud. Offensively smelling mud. Fashioned into shape. We're scientists now. Don't get squeamish. <laughs> Put your thinking caps on. Now keep in mind also that Iblis is the one who had a problem accepting this level of low life as his leader. You're going to put this crap over me, God. You kidding? I made a fire. You made him from crap. Black stinky mud fashioned into shape. Crap, though, is the best thing to use when you're cultivating the soil. Your crop 
is the best thing that the farmer uses when cultivating the field. And the farmer uses crap on his crop for production purposes. A khalifa as a crop is the best thing that God uses in order to cultivate the human soul. The soul that will be most pleasing to him is made of this dark, stinky stuff, fashioned into shape, given a sunnah, fastened into shape, masnoon, the place of sunnah. These quote-unquote angels, their concern was with the mischief called the facet, and also with the shedding of blood, which is given as ad in that ayah. ad sounds a little bit like Adam. Hmm? Has an allusion to the same frequency exchange that the word Adam has, ad but that means the blood. Dam is blood. So this word facet that's being used to describe mischief, and by the way, mischief is just a play on the terms mischief, the wrong chief, the wrong leader, the wrong person out front. Look at the words in English that come from this Quranic Arabic word facet. We get the word facade. Hollywood loves that one. When they build a town and it's nothing but props of wood, <laughs> right? wood propped up as the Quran describes in another surah. Hmm? Facade, that means the front of a building. The face, you see? Facade, facade, face, the face of the building. Also the word faucet in English comes from the Arabic word facet. And a faucet is a breach a spigot, a stopper, or a peg of a barrel. And they say it's of unknown origin. Wink, wink. <laughs> it's from a French word which means to damage or to break into. You see? There's also the English word facet, F-A-C-E-T which is a one it which represents one side of a multi-sided body so it's when there's a multi-sided body but you're only seeing one side of it you're seeing a facet of it so the angels this was their concern are you going to create a one who's going to just present to us a facet of what it means to be your armed or are you going to let us do our thing <laughs> as we've been doing uh, giving you the praise and saying subhanallah in the morning, in the evening. And uh, you're going to let us continue to do our rituals, God? Or are you going to bring in somebody who's not really going to be that concerned about being 100% your servant? But he's going to do his own thing. And at the end of the day, just present a one-sided type of reverence and respect for you. You know, a Sunday kind of respect or a Juma kind of respect or a synagogue Saturday kind of respect. But all of the other six days are going to be for Satan. <laughs> are you going to do that, God? Present this facet of, a, of an appearance of uh, submission to your will? Allah says in that famous ayah, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَعِلُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً قَالُوا أَتَّجْعَلُوا فِيهَا مَنْ يُحْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَا فَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَا وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّهُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ قَالَ إِنِّي عَلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Behold, your Rabb said to the angels, I am in the process of creating a vicegerent, a custodian, a khalifa fil ard, a khalifa in the earth. Some say on the earth. The angel said, will you place therein one who will make mischief 
therein and shed blood while we are celebrating your praises and glorifying your holy name and lighting the candles and making the ritual prayers and doing Ramadan and the celebrating the Eid and all of these other rituals and we're saying from our mouths la ilaha illallah and etc etc and uh, are you, now you're going to bring a Khalifa you're going to bring a, a, a custodian somebody who's going to turn off the lights and say party is over for what we're doing are you going to do that, our Rab? Well, because he is the Rab, he's in the process of evolving creation. So Allah is not satisfied with that level of your performance. So he said to them, Inni, certainly I, Alemu, have science, ma la, of what you do not ta'alamun. You don't have this science. I have not reciprocated this science. That's what the ta prefix on ta'alamun means. I have not reciprocated this level of science upon you. That's my business. I know what I'm doing. You stick to what I've created you to do. All of them bowed then. Except for Iblis. Illa Iblisi. He had issues. We'll deal with that at some other time. So the ikra or the reading that God wants humans to do involves the careful collecting. See, ikra means to collect. It involves the careful collecting of objects in Earth's environment. Collecting of objects with your five senses. Hmm? Look around, sniff around, listen around, feel around, smell around. Hmm? And let those influences go into your five sense development and affect you on the level of sensitizing you. You need to be sensitized before your senses can be properly activated for intellectual purposes. We're talking now about sensitivities that need to be in place before the establishment of sensibilities. That was another major lecture Imam Muhammad gave. Sensitiv uh, sensitivity and sensibility. Sensitivity is just meaning sense activity or activity in the senses. Once you establish activity in your senses, then you can establish ability in the senses or sensibilities. In that order, if you're not sensitive to things, you'll never be able to come into a sensible appreciation for those things. So the first reading, if you will, involves the reading of your environment, beginning with yourselves. You have to first be sensitive to your own concerns and then that sensitivity has to begin to pan out or stretch out to those in your immediate environment, your family members, particularly your extended family members, your cousin Pookie and your aunt, or, you know, Rochelle and all of them. And then it has to stretch out from your home and your family concerns to embrace your neighbors and their needs, neighborly needs, as it's called in the Quran. Ma'un, el ma'un, right? You have to embrace that level of concern. And then it gets broader and broader, just like a pebble thrown into the water that creates concentric, concentric circles that go out and out and out as a broadcast. So that's the first ikra is the point. Once your sensitivities awaken, it's going to begin to build an informational base in your mind, in your sensitivities, in your emotionality is what we're talking about. And it's going to do so in a way which is going to begin to process concepts. Concepts. These concepts are being formed inside of you on the instinctive and emotional levels of your development. So as you begin to feel your way into this world from 
infanthood, into childhood, etc. You're feeling your way. The things that come into your five senses first come in as feelings. And those feelings are registering in your nervous system a particular kind of way. And then you offer those feelings up to your intellect for perusal, for exploration. But the dawning of that sensitivity in you, I repeat, is on the levels of instinctive and emotional platforms. These two levels are registering in your reptilian and mammalian brains, the instinctive and the emotional brains in you. That's the first ikra. But Allah repeats that ikra. Ikra wa rabbuk al-akram. Al-ladhi a'lama bil-qalim. A'lama al-insana ma'lam ya'lam. Read and your evolver is most generous. The one who created the use of of the pen, the one who taught by way of the pen, taught the human being that which he before was not knowing. So the second collection, if you will, that collection, represents the generosity which results from the study of creation. And it's a generosity which allows for the collating of information. To collate is also to collect, but to collect in a way that causes what you're collecting to become orderly. Hmm? Orderly. So we are collating information that we're taking in from how we feel, from how we were impressed by a thing through our five senses. And we are then preserving that information by offering that information up to the emotional body which then hands it up to the intellect for observation for perusal that's the pen because that then is responsible for the writing down of those experiences within your coded genetics when you experience something over and over again when you experience something on the instinctive level, if you're impressed by something on the emotional level, it's going to go into your memory bank of the mammalian brain. And because you're thinking about it over and over again, you're trying to learn the lesson of it. If it's something that was negative that happened, what's the purpose in this? What's the message that God's trying to teach me in this? You hand that kind of back and forth perusal of a thing up to the intellect. So that you'll have a more non-emotional approach to resolving the issue if it's a problem or to appreciating the value of the good thing that happened that you're constantly remembering, remembering, putting all of the members back together so you can see the entire picture. So uh, this set of ayat they're speaking to the development of the human intellect. And it is the intellect which, when properly conditioned, can become the support beam for an extended antenna into the cosmos called the supra intuition. When Allah says, Ikra wa Rabu kal akram, read and your evolver. See, this is all a part of your human evolution. Read and your evolver is most generous el akram you don't get any more generous than the way that arabic term is phrased akram that's like saying akbar see that form it means it doesn't get any better than that so allah's generosity towards human beings towards a human growth and development doesn't get any better than what he's speaking on right now as a graduation in the human soul and in the human psychic makeup read and your evolver is most generous who taught by use of the pen he's using your five senses for this evolution for this graduation the 
pen means five. Five means pen. Pent means five. Pentagon, pentagram, on and on. It means five and is a reference to your five sense development, which is responsible for the sustaining of your intellect and your intellectual curiosities about things. Then Allah says, taught the human being what he was before not knowing. That means that this particular evolutionary process that Allah is bringing about amongst those called an insan is going to eventually result in a development that's going to take them even beyond five sense perception. It's going to take them even beyond what you can surmise, what you can figure out with your own brain through observation. Hmm? Allah is saying that what I'm delivering through this revelation that I'm asking you now to begin collecting into your psychic makeup, into your nervous system as frequencies. These frequencies coming from this Quran, from this revelation, is designed, Allah speaking, designed by me to eventually catapult you as a life form up to the graduated level that will take you beyond where your intellect and its five sense observation can take you. Your intellect can only observe material dynamics, material reality, and I'm not creating the human being to remain stuck on stupid when it comes to just uh, the use of material things around you. You are much more than a material being, uh, being human. You are created to eventually grow into cosmic proportions. Hence, the reason Instructor Bilal calls his reading of the Quran a cosmic reading of the cosmic Quran. So when that happens, عَلَّمَ insana malam yalam taught the human being that which he was before incapable of coming into as knowledge. If it were not for revelation, you'd be stuck on the level of a developing intellect. And the intellect is not compacted enough with the stuff necessary for your connections to the cosmos as a cosmic creature. So this power that we're talking about in this final stage of human evolution called the cosmic consciousness, if you will, this power is generated through the pineal organ, which sits in the middle of the brain, but is mostly calcified due to the intentional ploy on the part of social schemers to keep the masses out of this God-given power and ability. Your higher abilities are given in the Bible as Abel. There's Cain and then there is Abel. Cain is a tiller of the soil. He's a farmer. He's a vegetation man. He's an agriculturalist. But Abel was put in charge of the livestock. Those things that were born out of wombs. Now connect that with what the Quran says about having taqwa for the wombs that bore you. Allah didn't have to teach you to have reverence for the plant life. <laughs> You understood immediately that you needed that for survival. That was basic in your observations. But Allah does have to teach you to have reverence for living, breathing uh, forms that are born out of warm environments. But Abel in the Bible was slain. That same son of Adam in the Quran, who's not given a name in the Quran, he was slain by his brother. So says both books. 
and able, A-B-E-L, means exactly the same thing as the English word cable, C-A-B-L-E. So if Abel was killed and that caused a certain disillusion in the connection between humans and God, am I my brother's keeper was his attitude when questioned by God, where is your brother? He said, well, I don't know. I, was I supposed to hold his hand? <laughs> Wonderful wisdom we're being given through these scriptures. So Abel is cable. The A in Abel is also a guttural, like the K sound in cable, and also like the H sound in the word habl. The Arabic word habl means cable or rope, a connector. Allah tells us in the Quran to hold on to the cable of Allah. Hold on to the rope of Allah. And again, that word is habl. With the guttural H, the labial B, and the liquid L. Habla. Is also kabala. Some of you already see where this is going. The Jews put a lot of investment in the Kabbalah. That's their cable. That's their way, they believe, of communicating directly with their God. But Allah asks us to hold on to His cable. Not theirs. His cable. That is the cable which keeps your frequencies connected to the higher callings within your own nature. As that nature connects also with Allah's purpose for you. The Arabic word for the son of Adam called the Abel is Hibble. So you can see that H working in scriptural language. So again, Ikra wa Rabuk al Akram al Ladi Alam al Bin Qalam Alam al Insana Malam Yalam. This word, uh, Alaq. Allah says he created us from min alaq means clot as they translate it but means more importantly an attaching substance a substance that when it comes in contact with another substance it likes to stick and this is why sometimes they say a leech like clot because the leeches like to stick and draw the juices out of the thing they're stuck to for their own personal growth and development. So al is symbolic of many things actually and among those things is your mammalian brain. That's also an al because it is al to things in the environment and causing those things to become memorized in the brain. And after becoming memorized, it's able to emote those things which it has memorized. It's able to give you back concepts of things that it remembered. Things that it wants to talk about because they were lovely experiences in the memory. Some things it might not want to bring up ever again, but it's still lodged there in the memory bank of the mammalian brain. So the mammal brain in you is also an alak. We call that sticking. If you memorize something, 
Or if you can't memorize something, you'd be in school scratching your head. Your teacher says you still don't know the answer, Johnny, after I've taught this to you 10 different ways, 10 different times. Johnny says it's just not sticking. See, his mammalian brain hasn't been able to process it. It doesn't really mean that much to him for him to devote it <laughs> to a section of his memory bank. So this is the same sticking that's being given to you in the term homo sapien, which means thinking man. Homo means man or mankind, and therefore sapien is the part that must be referring to the ability of that man to think, male and female. Homo sapien is referring to humans who can memorize information so that it sticks like sap. You ever see something stick to the sap of a tree? Ever put your hand up on a tree that was dripping with sap and felt the stickiness, the adherence? Homo sapien is actually a watered down version of what the Quran gives us in the term al-insan that we've been discussing. Al insan as a meaning, according to Imam Muhammad, is a combination of your social nature as it produces an urge in you to think. See, the human being didn't really become a true thinker until he began to interface with other people, socially speaking. When it was just him and his family, or even just him and his tribal members, close members of his tribe, doing what they do, maybe not even knowing that other tribes existed across the river or over on the other side of the mountain or whatever. It was when humans began to interface with other humans and began to share experiences or maybe even go to war with each other for certain resources that were local that one or the other wanted to take claim to, solely take claim to. Whatever the involvement was, the social interaction was responsible for them to becoming, uh, for them becoming more and more socially inclined. So the human being is not born socially inclined. He has to evolve to be socially inclined. So al-insan is actually an evolutionary construct within the framework of human growth and evolution. Al-insan is not the first stage or level of evolution when it comes to human history and its growth and evolution towards excellence. The first stage, as I have been telling you, is captured in the Quranic word ins. Same consonants, the noon and the scene at work, but ins is the instinctive human, the one who's quick to volunteer. <laughs> God says, who wants to take control of the mountain, not part of me of the creation and be the, you know, the one in charge and uh, gave it to the mountain? They said, uh-uh. <laughs> offered it to other parts of the creation they stepped back and the human being fell forward and Allah says that certainly he is hasty and foolish <laughs> but he didn't say he couldn't have the position but that level of development in you if you allow it to lead you if you allow simply your instincts without conferring with the higher levels of emotionality, how you feel about it, and the higher, even more than that level of what you think about it based on information in front of you. If you don't allow those other levels of your cognitive development to take the lead, then that's what makes you hasty and foolish because you're, you're hasty because your instinctive nature is doing things quickly and presently because its job is to keep you here long enough for the higher development to take place in you. Understand the development. There's the ints. There is a nas. Same consonants different vowel positionings and then the creme de la creme el insan 
And when you know what these letters mean, coupled with the vowels that Allah chose to express those consonants through, that's where the true wisdom is. We won't go into that today. I've gone through that in previous classes, inshallah, after Ramadan ends and uh, we pick back up full speed with the university online learning course, our weekly course, Sunday course. We'll go deep, 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 deep down into the understanding of that. So it is the combination of our human social nature and our human urge to think now that we have to negotiate and work around the schedules of the people who we're meeting socially. It's that combination of the gregarious nature that wants to know other people and be curious about other lifestyles and other programs and all of that in society that make us think further and with more uh, uh, aggressiveness than we would if it were just us trying to figure out what tomorrow's breakfast is going to be. Yeah, you don't need a lot of brain power for that. Now, Imam W. Dean Muhammad said that if you want to know what America is definitively, then study ancient Egypt and ancient Greece. He said that America and everything that she represents is predicated upon the philosophy and the psychology and the ideology stemming from these two basic societies, ancient Egypt and ancient Greece. We have been viewing the world <clears throat> through the Egypto Greco eyes on the most part. And when that viewpoint was accepted by the Western world through the agency of linguists, particularly the, uh, particularly the ancient Phoenicians, who transported language systems across the ocean as seafarers and were able to cleverly inculcate a belief system along with the language systems that they were propagating. This belief system was inherently materialistic. Listen carefully. The belief system that came along with the dissemination of languages across the world by the Phoenicians in particular, also known as the ancient Canaanites, the Canaanites, some people would pronounce it. When they began to spread letter systems, they calculated into those systems ideas that would cause the recipients of those languages to also develop belief systems that would tie them into materialistic concepts and precepts. Keeping in mind that along with language comes frequencies. And these frequencies were designed specifically by the ancient Phoenicians and a few others to keep humans that were sold these languages as the way to go communication. It would keep these humans based on these frequencies on a dumbed down level which would cause those humans to see material life as the end all. Even though they're saying God, even though they're saying we believe in the unseen forces, still in their brains, they're seeing God and all of these unseen forces, the angels and all of these things in physical forms. If not, how did you get all of that physical representation on the walls of the churches and these other religious institutions? If these people were not being given language which caused them to become very comfortable with drawing out these idols, even drawing God in the Sistine Chapel of the Roman Church. Jesus, he's got to be given to you in physical form. The angels have to be given to you as little white cherubs with wings popping out of their backs. So the spiritual language 
was still able to effectuate a materialistic inclination in the people. And through that, they were able to weave their webs of racism, weave their webs of male superiority concepts, showing the actual snake wrapped around the tree, whispering into the ears of Eve, who caused all of this foolishness to take place and was actually the mother of evil in the world. They got that word evil from Eve. And then, of course, associating that issue of being tempted towards sin, perfidy, and all of these other bad things that we talk about, associating that beginning, at the beginnings of that inclination towards evil, associating it with the female. She, she, it's her fault, God. I was taking a nap. And she listened to the snake. She woke me up. I'm half asleep. I didn't know what I was eating. <laughs> God said, I'm going to curse you, but I'm going to really put a whammy on her. I'm going to make it so that every time she has to bring a baby into this world, it's going to be through pain and travail, as the Genesis says. I'm going to rock her pregnant world. And that's what many people under that ideology believe about pregnancy, that it's actually a sort of curse upon them from God for something that their great, 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 hold on, I got to take a breath, great, 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 great grandmother did in the garden. I didn't, I wouldn't there, I didn't, I would not have okayed it, but heck. I'm in her bloodline, therefore I still have to suffer after all of these many generations since the creation of Eve, supposedly in the garden. You see how this strategy goes? And the reason that this strategy was able to work so well on those who came out of Europe is because they were raised in an environment of rocks and stones. Their lands, on the most part, do not reflect any kind of paradisical image or environment. Europe was land poor, couldn't grow nothing, hardly. Resource poor, didn't have gold and diamonds like they do in Africa and other parts of the world. And they were people poor, people who, due to their own ignorance about things, were dying from simple diseases, dying by the thousands and by the millions in some cases, bubonic plague, all of these things came through and from Europe initially. And the only way that Europeans were to become wealthy in history was through the stealing of richness and riches from other lands and people. Therefore, along with their penchant for materialism, they also developed a proclivity for warfare, taking what they wanted and then keeping it because the people you took it from might try to come back and get it. The rise of European presence in modern history represents the ugly side of what a Khalifa, minus God's guidance, is bound to do in its quest towards mischief and bloodshed. Within this paradigm, European thinkers who entered the sciences identified what they believed to be two base pairs in what is now called the DNA. Deoxyribonucleic acid is what DNA stands for. What they are calling DNA is actually an operative dynamic of melanin intelligence. Now when I speak of melanin intelligence, I'm not speaking of it in the way that you have been taught about melanin as some super chemical component that makes darker people superior to all other people on earth. I'm not speaking about melanin in that context. 
You see, if, the, if it were true that melanin made black folks superior or dark skin superior, if that were true back then, it's not working now. I mean, superior in what way? You can stay out in the sun longer than Europeans? Okay, big deal. <laughs> How has that really helped your growth and evolution? See, melanin is simply the chemical substance that is necessary as an interface for metaphysical experiences to occur. And those experiences occur in the highest regions of human cognition, i.e., your pineal organ sitting center in, in your brain. So the pineal is coated with melanin and the melanin is simply serving as a biological interface so that your brain's frequencies will be able to reach newer and more profound levels of cognition, consciousness. Every human being has that capacity, not just African people, black people, dark people. That wouldn't make sense for God to do something like that. Create all these people and then just favor the ones who are the blackest. That doesn't even make sense. Stop bringing that to me. This intelligence is the stuff that the dark matter universe is made of. And melanin is a sort of telephone signal needed to put in a call to the creator and have the creator answer you. When you look in the Catholic Church and you see the black Madonna, she is symbolic of this black matter space which scientists say occupies 95% of our universe. Madonna and Medina, as I told you yesterday, they're essentially the same word. The black Madonna is symbolic of the black macrocosm called the cosmos or the universe, and it's a 95% melanated existence. That's the true meaning for the black Madonna. It's not a person who existed in history. She's a symbol of the universe and its ability to propagate melanin as a coating or an interface through which human beings via their pineal glands or pineal organs can get an answer from the universe when they call on one. Allah says, I answer the call of every caller when he calls. <laughs> So Madonna, the black Madonna, is speaking to the universe as our original Ummi or mother, Umm. Our original community is the universe or the cosmos itself. And the second one, Medina, is speaking to our earthly constructed community life, which is patterned after the cosmos. And even smaller than our earthly community, our social community, is the template community within our cellular structure that we spoke about yesterday. And its precious citizens or components known as DNA, RNA. The word cell, C-E-L-L, -L, is from or related, pardon me, to the word sight. Your cells are called the sites, like leukocyte, right? That's a cell. And that word sight is spelled C-Y-T-E. From that word comes the word C-I-T-Y, city. So all of your cells are cities. That's how your cellular structure, that's why it's also indicative of Medina as a template community. Medina is intended to replicate itself in multiple places, as does the RNA component of our cells. So you have Mecca, that's represented in your DNA. That's where the Dean is established. 
And then you have Medina, the replication that is intended to administer law, equality, justice, etc. in the social arena of man's existence. That's given to you in what the RNA is doing in your genes. So if you want to know what Mecca and Medina are supposed to be ideally in the world, study your DNA and your RNA. Major scientific clues I'm dropping on you now. And this is probably why Imam Muhammad supported New Medina in Hattiesburg, Mississippi so many years ago. Because he understood that there was nothing wrong with him giving the name Medina to cities outside of the actual Medina in Arabia. Medina, you can't do that with Mecca. You don't say New Mecca, but you can say New Medina because Medina is doing what the RNA is doing in terms of its replication of the DNA. That's what Medina is doing. You should see Medina all over the planet. Your city can be Medina. New Medina, Old Medina, Mid, I don't care what you put before Medina, but it can be a Medina. The place of Dean, the place where the social construct for the Dean is established. Now we're going to go a little bit deeper. I hope y'all are ready for this. The Jews who trained the early European mind, they did so through the establishment of religion, but they did it by establishing false religion. Imam Muhammad once said that when religion was born, Satan was born. Follow this closely. The Jews invented Christianity. Not all of them. A small wayward core of Jews who sought to put themselves in the place of God. They sought to put God as a creator to rest. And that's why the Torah mentions God resting on the seventh day. Well, who do you think took over from there? The ones who said, let us make man. See, that was after God rested. How are he going to get up and say, let us make man? And he's over there snoring. They put God as an active force in the life of the people. They put that force to rest. How did they do it? Through the, uh, the institution of very clever language schemes. As I said, a language scheme that promoted spiritual ideas on the surface, but which intrinsically promoted materialism. That's how they put God into a deep sleep, just like Adam. And that's how God came to rest. To the point where a new God, a newly established and uh, self-established, self-appointed God said, let us, meaning me and the people that I have concocted this scheme with, let us make man in our image, meaning following our program. Hmm? So they invented Christianity, which was intended to sublimate the European thirst for worshiping material idols. They understood when they studied the European that the European was thoroughly entrenched hmm, with idol worship. It was all throughout the mythologies. Thor and this one and that one and animals, half animal, half humans. And they, the European's mind was so Oh, my goodness. Inundated with these images that the Jews couldn't just come in there and say, listen, there's one God, one humanity. Now, let's make let's make some progress. They couldn't do that because they had to first develop a system for extricating the materialistic tendencies out of European ideology. They didn't see themselves as being able to do that overnight. So instead of giving them Judaism, which called for one God worship. They gave them an invented religion called Christianity, which was intended to gradually bring them into the understanding of the oneness of God and the oneness of people, etc. 
even though the Jews themselves had a, a, an extremely corrupted idea related to who those one people should be. They saw themselves as being that chosen people and they began to warp their ideology to the point where all other human beings became incidental. It was God and Israel to the rescue. Everybody else is supposed to work for us. So this invented religion, which eventually came to be called Christianity, was invented to waylay hmm, and to sidestep the problems that they believed would occur if they introduced monotheism, quote unquote, to the, to the Europeans as an immediate measure of religion. Myth, as the Europeans were understanding it, was their way of life. The beliefs in the myths, they still have it. That's why they give you all of these superhero movies and you know all of these people are still here with you. Spider-Man and Superman and all of these myths that are born out of ancient myths from Europe. But the wiser people of the ancients, including the ancient Jew, they used myth as a way of locking up the precious concepts. See, myths are only explaining what's happening in the dynamics of electromagnetism and other forces in the world. They simply humanize them. And you can tell easily if you hear that Thor is the god of thunder, then it's not really a human. They're just mythologizing what thunder does. It was their way, I repeat, of locking up precious concepts so that the pagans could not decipher them. These Jews then began to introduce the European mind to pseudoscience which was really symbolism in disguise. Much of what we have now, and this is why science changes its robes about every 10 years in America and in the world, is because the original language that science was given from these crafty ancients, the original language that they had it couched in, was not scientific per se, it was pseudoscience and religiously coded language that was masquerading as true science. Still is. The numerology that they give you, how many chromosomes and XY genes, all of that is religious coding. Mr. Farad peeped it. W.D. Farad peeped it. And he came here and said, call these people X. <laughs> See how big X is in the world now? You even had major movies. The X-Men. The X-Files. We're going to get to the most recent X in a minute. Stay tuned. Here we go. So this was language. This pseudo scientific stuff. The terminology. This was language which allowed the wayward Jew whom we're speaking of who bucked the, the, the actual instructions of his own scripture called the Torah. He was bucking the instructions given by his own scripture. And he did that mostly through the intervention or the introduction of his rabbinical writings which came to be known as Talmud. Talmud. So it allowed that wayward one to always be one up on the intellectual movements of the Europeans whom they sent out to conquer the world and to do so in a way which would bring the world's pocketbooks back to their Jewish coffers. Now keep in mind I don't even think I have to tell you that this is not anti-Semitism. 
I began this conversation by telling you that this is a comparatively small number of Jews that have concocted this tremendously grand scheme. Most Jews have no clue what this is talking about or what their ancestors have actually done. Not that they're not benefiting from it. That's another story. The fact is, is that the majority of them have not been brought into the deeper wisdom of how this scheme occurred in the first place. And this is the scheme which is relegated to that comparatively small number of conscious manipulators among the Jewish people. Now going back to the idea of Melanin, melanin, listen carefully, is the expressed intelligence within the hydrogen atom, A-T-O-M. The word Adam in scripture, A-D-A-M, is the code word for the scientific name a T O M D and T are interchangeable in linguistics. So Adam is also Atom. And Adam being created from black and or red clay, depending on what dictionary you read, is symbolic of the potentiality which God created within the atom's core. In the Quran, this atomic potential is also to be identified under the term Al-Kitab. Al-Kitab does not mean book. Thalik Al-Kitabu La Raiba Fihi does not mean that is the book in it is sure guidance. So we're going to grow you up through your introduction to nunetics and to the scientific method which correlates the Quran with cosmically measured intelligence. Al-Kitab is a reference to intelligence which has become codified or coded. The word codify is consonantally connected to the word Kitab. T and D are interchangeable. B and F are interchangeable. So codify and kitab are essentially the same word. And when you codify something, you code it. C-O-D-E. The word kitab, look it up. It refers to an engraved etching, which is difficult to be removed, such as the carvings in a tree that you would put there with your blade, your switchblade. You ever see the hearts in the trees that some people carve? You come back a hundred years later, if the tree is still standing, the winds, the rain, the snow, all of that had no bearing in terms of the erasure of those carvings. That's what kitab means. And there's only one other place in nature where you can find that kind of engraving. It's in your genes. It's in your DNA, RNA makeup that you find God engraving intelligence, the internal communication in your genes. He put that information there. That's where your kitab is. So when Allah says again, That is the engraved marking. There is no doubt in it. There is no exaggeration in it. There, it, it is guidance. It is huda lil muttaqin, guidance for the possessors of taqwa. So, if you don't possess a sacred regard for what you're investigating as information, as knowledge, as your nature, as social nature, and all that, you will not get the benefits of al kitab. 
Everything in creation contains an identifiable marker which leads back to this hydrogen atom's oneness. That's how you become one because everything in creation leads back to the hydrogen atom. Everything is a composition of hydrogen atoms. That's your Tawheed. The Quran tells us that everything has been created min ma from water. That's hydrogen. Now these are the four nitrogenous bases, as science calls them, that are found in DNA. Listen carefully. They call them the four letters of DNA. Guanine, adenine, thymine, cytosine. These are the four letters or the four bases. These bases are then to be divided into two categories. The thymine and the cytosine are considered pyridim, uh, pyridim, uh, pyrimidines, like pyramid pyrimidines, thymine and cytosine, pyrimidines, while adenine and guanine are called purines. The divine will of our Creator is imprinted upon the melanin template of all organic and even some inorganic matter. Allah's will and purpose for that matter, that intelligizes matter, including the human matter called biology, His will is imprinted upon the melanin template of all organic and some inorganic matter. In the Quran, the word Mala'ik, which they translate as angels, is a code word for what science, through the study of the Quran, came to recognize as molec or molecules. So when these very, very wise people who studied the Quran like we don't during Ramadan, because we didn't have the codes, we're getting them now through what I'm giving you. The Muslim Moors gave them the language codes, the lang gave them some of them, not all of them. Nunetics, believe it or not, has all of the codes and all of the keys because we have the meaning for all of the letters all over again. <laughs> and not only on one level, on three major levels. So again, look at the consonants in malaic and in malik or molecule. And even in Malik, as in Malik Yawmidin, or Malik, as in King. The word King is consonantally connected to Malik. If you exchange the M for the N, you have the same letters, the same sounds. K-N-G, M-L-K. No, I'm one off there. Scratch that one. <laughs> don't, don't, don't kitab that one. Don't engrave it. Scratch that one. <laughs> All right. But you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Conceptually. All right. Now, this was, as I said, the information which Muslim Moors passed down to European Spaniards when they were civilizing Spain, teaching them their first... Uh, irrigation system, how to build their first irrigation system to keep themselves clean perpetually. Hmm? This was the information that was passed down to those Spaniards by the Muslim Moors, which the Spaniards then took to Italy, to France, and to other countries in Europe, and it, it, it is what sparked the beginnings of the European Renaissance, and they admit that in their history books. So these two divisions into pyri uh, pyri pyramidines, hard to pronounce for the African tongue, pyridima, pyridima, you know what I'm saying, pyrimid uh, pyramidines, pyramidines, there you go, pyramidines, 
and purines. <laughs> These two divisions of the four letters in your DNA, RNA are also referred to by the ancients as the yin yang. Thank you, Asia. That's a lot easier to pronounce. Yin yang. Science now refers to them simply as the feminine masculine principles of operation in creation that are found everywhere in creation. The best of example of which is magnetism and electricity or electromagnetism. So the four elements are also divided into pairs. There's fire and air which are masculine just like the thymine and cytosine are masculine and there is the water and the land that equate with the adenine and the guanine as purines and they're feminine. The manipulative forces who established this European power base they chose to unpack its plan first within the two feminine principles, the fields of water, which means economics, and land, which stands for the culture. So again, these manipulative forces first went after economics and culture, water and land as opposed to the two masculine fields of fire, which represents academics, and air, which represents government. That's not where they started. They didn't start with the masculine. They saw that the easiest way to go in order to initiate their scheme was to come through the agency of the feminine principled areas. These major demonic influences in our society got their foothold first in commerce and then in Hollywood, the culture. They know that feminine principle, the things are the easiest to penetrate and impregnate. You get it? So whoever controls the money holds sway over your instinctive drive. It is your instincts that are calling for food, clothing, and shelter, etc. And whoever controls the cultural platforms will be in control of how you view yourself and how the world will view you. See, the world learned to view so-called black folks through the prism of Hollywood. Little rascals. Sambo, nigger Charlie. See, this is how they learned us. Or how they thought they were learning us. That's how we became to be lazy, shiftless, no count. Even though we worked for 300 or so straight years. In the process of building this country. As Malcolm said, working from can't see in the morning to can't see at night. Does that sound like shifty, shiftless, low down, lazy? Does that sound like that to you? No. But Hollywood presented that picture. They painted that picture. And that's the picture that was accepted by all of the onlookers in the world. To this day, there are people in Japan and other places, China, that look down upon African-American people. Because they believe the hype that was brought to them on the screen. And then we exacerbated through the foolish kinds of influences that we send into our music and into other aspects of the culture. Stupid movies, all of that. We are now contributing the worst, or I should say to the worst, images of our people. So these minority of wicked Jews brought this scheme out of Egypt. They studied it thoroughly while in Egypt. And the name Egypt itself is a play on the jipping of the E or the I. Egypt, I, Egypt, vision, jipped. In the nation of Islam under the honorable Elijah Muhammad, a character was introduced called the Yaqub. Yaqub 
is not a literal person in history. Yaqub is a symbol of an energy frequency. Listen to me carefully. Man, I wish that some members of that nation of Islam are on this line. If they are, maybe they are. They're going to appreciate this. Yaqub is a symbol of an energy frequency that has permeated the European sciences. That's why they depict Yaqub as a scientist, a mad scientist, big-headed scientist. Big-headed simply means arrogant. This frequency, which is centered around the study of carbon, is the focus of all European scientific scholarship. They are infatuated with carbon and melanin. And carbon as an element is given the numbers 666 because carbon is a combination of six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. Known secretly in their language as the beast because that's your flesh that's being spoken about and your flesh minus your elevated mind is nothing but a beast. But it doesn't make it evil. It just makes it non-human in terms of its operation and its inclinations. So they are the ones, the European scientists under this Yakub energy, they are the ones who have implicated DNA as the main culprit behind why humans do the ignorant and evil things that we do. See, it, it, it's, it's still a popular idea in Western science that the genes are in control and that the genes are responsible for all of this wayward behavior. And it has been recent scientists such as Bill, uh, pardon me, as uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton that have dedicated their lives to extricating the gene from the responsibility of all of this wayward stuff. And have implicated those environmental influences that people have purposely allowed to become loose and rampant in society. That is actually responsible for the evil. Not the gene. Not the gin. You get it? Iblis in the end says, I only call them. They came of their own free accord. That's the gene talking. So stop thinking jinn as some spooky, spiritual, invisible something floating around waiting until you go in your bathroom so it can run in there and flush the toilet behind you. And start thinking of jinn in reference to the connections to genetics, genes. And your genes also have the capability of evolving your life until the point where your life itself can reach jinnah. See, you can move from the level of gene or gin domination to the level of jenna exploration. All of it has been packed very neatly and nicely by Allah into your genetic package that we call intelligence. Once that intelligence in you is able to meet its uh, likeness in the cosmos what's called cosmic intelligence. When you can interface with the cosmos, as we've been discussing, then you're going to find yourself participating in an evolution that will put you into peace, like Imam Muhammad said he was in. And nobody will be able to disturb that peace. I'm a witness. I believe I've reached it. Maybe I haven't been challenged enough, but <laughs> I've had some real challenges. And I'm telling you, I live a life of relative peace. So to blame it on the DNA as the main culprit is really just a roundabout way of saying what false religion has taught as man being born in sin. See, science is saying that human beings are born with corrupted genetics that are causing us to do wayward and outrageous things to each other. But it's just coded language for the religious language that they were fed 
which told them that man was born in sin. Now remember, science has only taken religious language and reintroduced it as scientific theory. The word theory itself means guesswork. Allah answers the born in sin theology. They say born in sin and shaped by iniquity. Allah answers that in the Quranic phrase, No, I created you, Hama and Masnoon. Meaning that you weren't born in sin, you were born very warm. Ham, Haman, very warm. Masnoon. And fashioned into shape by the vicissitudes of traditional life. Meaning, as you do things repeatedly over and over again and you become used to them to the point where they become your tradition. Inherent in those behaviors are going to be fluctuations like the sine wave. You're not born in sin, you're born in sine. That's S-I-N-E. And that sine wave is going up and down up and down, up past the equator, down below the equator, up past the equator, down below, and that will happen until you flatline. Beep. Now I'm going to drop something really, really heavy on you. I hope you're ready for it. And we will have concluded for today. These Yakub type European scientists are in the process of unrolling an artificial substitute gene that they have named XNA. Look it up for yourself. XNA is considered to be an evolved form of DNA RNA genetic programming. Now this mindset that is unrolling this XNA gene believes that it can do things bigger and better than God. God created DNA, RNA. We're going to introduce XNA. What does Iblis say in the Quran? Ana khayrun minhu. I am better than him. Speaking about Adam and his creation, his natural creation. Iblis said, Allah says, submit to this one. He said, Ana khayrun minhu. He said, I cannot submit to one whom you have created, Haman Masnoon, from this black stinky stuff fashioned into shape. You created me, Minar, from fire. I am better than him. Ana khayrun minhu. I'm more useful than him. Researchers Philip Hollinger and Vitor Pinheiro, synthetic biologist at the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, UK. They say that their findings in terms of this XNA component of artificially inserted genetics, they say that these findings will have major implications in everything from biotherapeutics to exobiology to research into the origins of genetic information itself. How genetic information became what it is. This new paradigm in what I call weird science has been reached outside, or I should say has reached outside, of the boundaries set by our ancestors who kept their research within the confines of Allah's fitrah based four major elements. See, our ancestors, they investigated science and fitrah and did some major things in science, but they never thought to reach outside of the paradigm of four basic elements. And what produced those elements, the ether. We'll get into that at some other time. Now, in the Quran, these ancestors that we're speaking of now are called the Ulul al Bab. Imam Muhammad translated that as people of the first door. But it actually means people of the original genetically inherited intelligence, people who were in touch with their own intelligence. They were sensitive to it and they were able to equate that intelligence within them with the super intelligence of the cosmos itself. That's what brought them into monumental sciences. 
that science existed in ancient Egypt. It existed in many, many of the ancient cultures and societies, some of whom predate the glory of ancient Egyptian uh, science. Ulul el Bab. And the first door that we come through as humans is the door of our original genetically inherited intelligence. That's the first door. Now the European was chosen for this task of world conquering because of his, dif uh, his difficulty in absorbing metaphysical and deeply spiritual concepts. He was, remember, in an environment of rock. That was his challenge. It doesn't mean he couldn't or can't rise above that, but that happened to be his particular challenge. The challenge for the African world, as Imam Muhammad explained in an article, is not their spiritual development, but the fact that the African continent kept them separated from most of the rest of the world, so they did not become interested in exploring the world and were kept mostly and mainly within the confines and the borders of their countries and if not their countries definitely the continent to look at the continent it does not support travel easy travel from one place to another outside of the african continent itself in fact when the european began to explore africa the reason why they called it the Dark Continent was because it was extremely difficult, if not impossible, to penetrate into the interior of the continent. So they had to remain coastal. That's why many of the people who were brought there as, uh, or, as or intended to be slaves were brought from the coasts of Africa, West Africa in particular. Europeans went into South Africa, see? They went into these coastal countries and regions, but found it very well. But when they started trying to get into the interior, they were met with some power that they weren't ready to contend with. So this is the reason the European was chosen because of his background, because of his environmental circumstances that created a psychic makeup in him that was deeply dedicated to materialism. So to override that psychic uh, phenomenon in him related to materialism, uh, metaphysical ideas had to really, really be uh, situated in his brain in a way that would rearrange <laughs> literally the molecules that were creating the materialistic inclination in him as a people I'm talking about. So these ancient wayward Jews, they saw that proclivity in the European because of his fascination by mythology and all of these physical concepts of even spiritual ideas. And they said, here's the one we need. So they began to feed him something that would cause his attention or his focus to become mostly physically oriented or materially oriented. So when they began introducing the European to the sciences, they were limited in scope to the biological, the 666 aspects of science. The matter. Imam Muhammad advised us to become more interested in the meso metaphysical than in just the physical. He did that for a reason, people. It is in the me metaphysical concepts where you're going to find the more deeply spiritual ideas that scriptures, especially the Quran, are attempting to present to your brain. Metaphysical and spiritual concepts are born out of a cognitive relationship with melanated matter. That matter in the Quran is known as dunya. You've all heard that term. You poo-poo that term because you've been taught incorrectly about what dunya is. Dunya is not something to be poo-pooed or to be rejected. 
If it is, why do you ask for it in a dua from the Quran? Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan. Huh? My Rabb, give us the excellence of uh -huh. the dunya. There's, there's hasan in the dunya? I thought the dunya was bad, bad, bad. Hmm? No. Allah clocked excellence into the dunya. What Allah is against is your pre, uh, not your pre, but your over occupation with what's called the hayyatu dunya, the life of the dunya. Let's explain that and we'll close out after this. This is part one. And I got some goodies coming up for you that you need to hang on and listen for. So there's nothing wrong with the dunya. Dunya is related to the word deen, whether you realize it or not. Because you can't have deen unless you're working with the dunya, the material existence. But if you're caught up in the inspiration that stems from an over-concentration on material dynamics, then you're caught up in what's called the hayyatu dunya, which means the life energies emanating from the dunya that are keeping you, like they, keep, like they kept that European, stuck on stupid when it comes to allowing material things to be your ilah. That's where the problems are. So with that said, I'm going to open back up the phones. And uh, those who I have uh, email addresses for, I'm going to send you a very significant piece of writing and an article sent to us by our um, nunetic learner, Bilal Yassin El Amin. And it deals very importantly with what I have been discussing concerning the pineal gland. And several other conversations and uh, websites and whatnot. You need to really listen and read very carefully what he says in these articles, some of which he wrote himself. And then uh, tap into these websites that he's included in his email. I'm going to send that. If I have your email address, you'll get it along with the replay of this uh, conversation today. If I don't have your email, I can't help you. <laughs> and uh, also... If you know that you're one of the people who have sent me uh, funds for any of my books, especially this last book, and you have not, and you sent it through Cash App, but you did not include your address, I can't help you either. I thank you, but I can't help you. I can't send you a book to an address that I don't have. So think back <laughs> and make sure that you re uh, email me your full name and full address. I'd appreciate it. I'd love to put this book in the mail to you, but I don't know where to find you. All right. My email address, once again, is, in fact, I'm going to give you a different one because the, um, the latest one now, somebody's messing with it, <laughs> the Cosmic Quran. I get some stuff. I don't get some stuff. I email out some stuff and it doesn't go to any of you. And I think you got it and you didn't. So we're going to have to reconfigure this whole email situation. I know people are watching and listening to me and they don't like what I do, but they can't stop this. It's too late. Allah is in control of this. So use the email Nunetics2. N-U-N-E-T-I-C-S, the number two, at gmail.com. Let's go back to that. It's been acting nice to me lately. <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's softened now that it realizes that I don't need it. <laughs> this started to act right after I neglected it. Huh? All right. So again, I'm going to spell it out. Nunetics2 at gmail.com. N-U-N-E-T-I-C-S, the number two, at gmail.com. Now, keep in mind, you may receive emails from me from two or three or four different emails. So whatever you see and you don't recognize it, still look at it. Might be from Ben Dot Bilalian, might be from Nunetics without the two, Nunetics with the two, you know, instructor Bilal at yahoo.com. That's all me. So, however, I'm trying to reach you, if that goes through, that's the one. I, if I don't reach you at one, I'm going to send it through another. Believe that. <laughs> okay. So, if you've sent money and you need to send your address, please do so through those uh, portals or through those channels, and I'll be more than happy to accommodate you for the rest of you. Um, between uh, yesterday and today and tomorrow, I'm sending out books on a daily basis. You know, I had to re-up on the color uh, cartridges and that kind of stuff. I print all of my books myself, as you know. 
So you'll, you'll be getting it soon, inshallah. Some of you will get it tomorrow. Some will get it the day after. You know, some might get it the beginning of next week. But if you ordered it and you paid for it, you're going to get it. Trust that. And you're going to appreciate it once you get it. Trust that also. So with that said, let me uh, open up the lines. Let me secure my Amir first. Hold on. All participants are muted. Hold on. All participants are unmuted. Hold on, hold on. All participants are muted, and they can unmute themselves. Yeah, that's the one I'm looking for. Amir, are you there? Yes, I'm here. All right, so stand by. Uh, let's just... Uh, in fact, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to open up the lines today. I'm going to ask you... Um, Participants, uh, just looking at the time, I really intended to be through by 5 p.m. my time. I'm going to ask you to email me, as you have been doing. You've been uh, sharing some wonderful sentiments with me pertaining to what it is you've been learning from me. And I'm going to be using some of those comments for my next book. My next book it will be available in June, the middle of June. So continue to send those to me. They're, they're going to help what I'm doing. If you want to help me, that's the best way to help me. Don't just say thank you. Don't just say that was nice. You know, really, I mean, put it together. Think, I don't care what your English is like or what your spelling is like. That doesn't matter. All right. I want to know what your heart is like. So send me your heartfelt responses to the language and the knowledge and the newness and the questions or whatever you might have. Feel free to send that to me through those email portals. So that's the first thing. Uh, something else I was going to say just got away from me. Okay, not as important, obviously. All right, so I'm going to turn the microphone over to our Amir Adib Abdullah of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Very excellent uh, host. And we're going to close out with uh, a closing dua and insha'Allah. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Tomorrow, uh, I'm going to do um, what I'm calling <laughs> a night of power lecture. It's probably going to take place around 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. After you've made your salat and got your reading in, or most of us are still sequestered at home so it's not a matter of us going out to the masjid unless your city has opened and that's what y'all are deciding to do those who remain home are going to experience information inshallah on a level unmatched when it comes to a night of power delivery so I want you to prepare for that we'll still have our regular 3 p.m. afternoon call where I will be uh, concluding my comments on this subject which, as you know, is a very important subject. It's a delicate subject, but it's important for us to know. And then we're going to go into our night. I will be teaching on Laylatul Qadr. From that surah, Al-Qadr, the night of power, right? Or the power. And uh, be prepared for that. Make sure that you've eaten your meal before you join us. Or that you are eating your meal as you join us. If that's your need. And I believe that's the end of the announcements that I have, Amir. You can uh, step in here and take it to its conclusion, inshallah. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you. I would be remiss after uh, hearing the instructor talk about uh, 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 2201. So I will uh, do that, and we have a better understanding now of what dunya is and how good the excellence of doing it, how not to go higher doing it, over centralizing the energy or material things that substitute as our creator. We're better at Tina to do your happiness and what's the Akiwati happiness and why Tina at Sarvena, our sustainer, maintainer, uh, evolver. Give us good in this world, the excellence of the dunya, and not over activating ourselves to make the dunya material pursuit to our life. And goodness in this world, and especially the things that we do, to have good in the hereafter. And please protect us from the torment of the lower three chakras. And Noor, I mean. Excellent explanation. Thank you.
I'm, I'm so happy every time that I know that people who are learning from me are paying attention. <laughs> That's all I ask you to pay for this three o'clock call. Pay attention. And with that, I greet you with the greetings of peace that obligate each and every one of us to keep the peace. Salamu alaikum. Wa alaikum Alhamdulillah, Afwan. Thank all of you for being with me.